so thanks for your patience, thanks. Uh, thank you, welcome today, the Friday afternoon. Thanks for joining us on a, on a beautiful afternoon. Welcome, this is the uh, Washington Tech Business Department Executive Lecture Series, the November version. So I'm Tim Colbert from the Business Department. I have the honor of introducing today's speaker. So Dr. Jason Hartline is a computer science professor at Northwestern University. He's been on the faculty since 2008. Is that right? And before that, he did a, a postdoctoral fellowship at Carnegie Mellon and worked in some livestock research facilities in Silicon Valley. He's got a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering and Computer Science from uh, Cornell, right? Cornell University, and his PhD is from the University of Washington. So I'm looking forward to this presentation. Please join me in giving you a nice warm welcome. All right, thank you so much, and uh, thanks uh, for the invitation to speak here. Um, uh, so I'm a, as, uh, I'm a uh, computer scientist, and, uh, but I've been working in a space that's at the intersection between computer science and economics and business uh, for basically my entire professional career. Um, but with that said, my perspective on some of the questions that we ask in this space are a little bit different. So I encourage you, if you're coming from this from a different perspective, is just to try to interpret the, the, what I'm going to talk about uh, as, as you most prefer. Um, I'll, I'll uh, present to you a little bit about why computer scientists care about this kind of, this kind of question. Um, this is joint work with uh, a good colleague, Ashuti Chawa, at the uh, University of uh, Wisconsin-Madison, uh, who's also a computer scientist, and Dennis Nicopella, who's at the University of Virginia, and he's an econometrician, which is uh, statistics for economics. Um, and uh, and uh, so, you know, as a computer scientist, working in this you know, interface between mechanism design and data science, and this is something that, um, you know, economists have been studying this since the 80s or even before, and econometricians have been studying this even before that. And so it's a really old field, but the, the take on it we have from computer science is a little bit different, and so I encourage you to see, uh, you know, how the different perspective uh, may be interesting. Uh, great. Um, so, uh, again, so some of my motivation coming at this from a computer scientist is the following. So uh, computer science is a field that's about 70 years old. Um, we've gotten really good at making these things work, although I wasn't very good at doing it today. Um, and so we're pretty good at making computation happen on computers, on networks of computers, and these kinds of things. Um, and one of the uh, things about uh, understanding how to get computers to work, it's actually, it's really complex what's going on in there. And so you're having to reason about very complex computations uh, to understand when computations work and when they don't work and how to make them work better. Okay, and uh, I think one of the things I think is super exciting about the future of computer science is that we're gonna, I think there's going to be an opportunity to bring those ideas from understanding how computation works inside these things to understanding how computation works sort of broadly in the world. Okay, and so I think um, understanding how to guide computation in the wild is a uh, Topic of quite a, a, you know important scientific interest, um, and uh, you know when you're thinking about making these things work, your computational primitives are like these logic gates, and you write programs with loops and controls and whatever to make things work. Um, the computational primitive that happens in computation in the wild is usually local optimization. Okay, so if you've taken classes in um, chemistry or physics, you know that things like to be in low energy states. That's all the individual particles trying to optimize for themselves to be in low energy states. Um, or if you are studying economics or business, you know that the different parties coming to an interaction are going to be optimizing for themselves to try to get the best uh, arrangement for themselves in that interaction. And that's also a local interaction. Um, so the computational primitive I'm interested in is this local strategic optimization, okay? But what, I'm, what I care about is whether my system uh, on a whole achieves good outcomes, okay? So when a bunch of individuals get together and they interact under some rules of the system, 
right? And they are optimizing for themselves. And then after all that, what's the outcome, right? Is that outcome a good outcome? And so I'm understanding how, you know, if we can maybe uh, change the rules a little bit uh, of the way people interact, can we get better outcomes? And how do we get those better outcomes? Okay, so that's uh, my perspective there. Um, I think there's a key application area coming from um, computer science, uh, which I call online markets. And many of uh, the undergrads that I, that I teach at Northwestern University go on to get jobs at tech companies. Uh, and these tech companies are actually building the Ubers, the Airbnbs, the um, Stack Exchange, Tinder, you, you name it. If it's, a, if it's an app on your phone, probably there's some kind of online market underneath it. Uh, that's making it all work. Um, and I think of these online markets abstractly where people come to them and they're looking to um, maybe make exchanges with other people or maybe they're just looking for information that are provided by other people. But either way, it's an interaction and um, the platform encourages this interaction. And if you change the way the platform works, people are going to interact differently. Okay, and what I'm interested in is how do we think about how we make those changes to the platform so that when people interact on the platform, we get good outcomes? Okay, that's what I'm interested in thinking about. Okay, so um, I think the short-term goal is I'd like to have a good theory of, uh, or I'd like to be able to teach my undergrad class on online markets so that the students who take my class can go on and get jobs at these tech companies, and when they're building these systems, they're a little bit more informed about the fact that, hey, you're actually building a marketplace, okay? And so you actually have to think about the fact that people are coming and interacting, and then there are going to be some outcomes. And what you need to think about when you're designing a system that then leads to these outcomes. Okay? Um, so that's sort of my short-term goal. My long-term goal is to really understand computation in the web. Cool. So um, here's something that might happen in one of these online marketplaces, maybe eBay. Uh, so uh, I have, hey, my slides are um, not fully on the screen. That's going to be fun. Uh, so I have bidders uh, with private preferences. And maybe they're going to bid in this auction. I have, I have an auction here. Um, and so um, that's an economic mechanism. The auction is going to decide from the bids who wins and what they pay. Okay? So here's what might happen. These bidders might have in mind what the thing we're selling is worth to them. Okay? So bidder one thinks it's worth $4, bidder two thinks it's worth $12. Okay? But of course, they're going to be competing in this auction. They're strategizing about how should they best bid to get a good outcome from this auction, right? So they're optimizing for themselves. And so if you're uh, Mr. Uh, bidder 1, and you're thinking it's worth $4 to me, you're thinking, but I want to get a good deal. So I'm not going to bid $4. I'm going to bid something <coughs> less than $4. Okay, so um, it might be that uh, we run the auction and get these bids. Okay, and then um, this auction from these bids should decide what to do. Uh, so this auction, uh, say it's the uh, first price auction, it means highest bidder wins, and the person who wins pays their bid. Okay, so here bidder two bid six dollars, and so they won, and they're going to pay six dollars. Everyone else loses and pays zero. Okay. Um, the thing I want to draw your attention to here is that uh, these bidders, when they're thinking about how they're going to bid in this auction, are thinking about the fact that there's an interplay of what the other people are bidding and what the rules of the auction are. Okay, and so. Um, if we were to change the auction rules, that might also result in the bidders changing how they decide to bid in the auction. Even if it was the exact same set of bidders. The exact same set of bidders with a different auction would probably bid differently. Okay? And so now I'm going to, um, this was, as I said, the first price auction. So I'm going to note that the way that the auction chooses its outcome is going to affect the input that the auction gets. Okay, because the rules matter for how you behave in such a system. Okay, so um, coming from a computer science point of view, we're often thinking about getting inputs and computing outputs in the field of algorithms. Okay, but in the field of algorithms, usually your inputs are sort of 
fixed exogenously. We just want to have an outcome that's good for the input you got. Okay? And in this situation, the real input that I care about is the actual values, $4, $12, $2, $6. $6. But my algorithm never saw that. My auction never saw that. It only saw the input bids, $2, $6, $1, $3. Right? So, um, so that's going to be a challenge for algorithms because we don't actually get the input we want. Right? And it's also going to be a challenge for data science because if I'm a data scientist thinking, oh, let's suppose I ran a bunch of these auctions. Okay, I'm some online platform. I've been running these auctions for years. And I'm thinking, huh, maybe I can tweak my, my auction to get a better outcome for everybody. Like, I can change the rules and hopefully get a better outcome. And here's the thing. The thing is I have a bunch of data that's how people would have bid in the auction I did run. And if I change the auction, I should expect an entire new set of bids, which I don't have any data for. Okay? So there's, some, there's a fundamental like, disconnect in um, the fact that there's strategic behavior happening here and the fact that people are changing what they do based on what we're actually, what mechanism, what auction we're running. Okay? And so that presents challenges for both how we think about algorithms and how we think about data science. Okay? How we think about analyzing our data. Because if the data, if we were, again, if we're analyzing our data so as to improve things in the future, which I think is a good goal to have, um, we need to be careful because the data that we got now might be generated because of what we were doing. And if we change things, we're going to get different data with different properties. Okay? And so we need to make sure that we're thinking about things right. Um, cool. So I want to give you a motivating example. This comes from uh, uh, search engine advertising. Um, so you probably have seen uh, Google's search uh, page. Uh, and if you punch in Google's search page, search advertising, um, uh, which I did, uh, you'll get some ads for people telling you how to maybe advertise on Google or something. You can hire these companies to uh, improve the number of uh, hits your, uh, your website gets on Google. And so if I do search advertising, you notice I get one ad that's on the so-called main line, and I'll get a bunch of ads on the sidebar. Um, and here's the thing I think is interesting. If I do a sort of equivalent search for search engine marketing, which is the same thing as search advertising, I'm going to get three main line ads now and a bunch of sidebar ads. Right? That's just what happened. And so here's a question. So these are probably the same search, right? Search advertising, search engine marketing, the same thing. But somehow I got three ads in one and one ad in the other. So here's my question, which is better? Okay, if you're Google, you're thinking, huh, I could choose to show three ads, I could choose to show one ad, which is better? Okay, so here's my question. How many mainline ads should we show? Um, and one of the sort of main techniques in the industry for evaluating a question like this is A-B testing. A-B testing is the industry jargon for randomized controlled trials, which here at the university we're pretty good at. Um, but they call it A-B testing, and what is that? You just randomly split your traffic into two groups. You give one group one treatment, the other group another treatment, and then you learn what are the differences in the two, uh, across the two treated classes. Okay, so here's an example. Let's suppose I want to estimate the probability someone clicks on the, main, the top ad in the mainline. Okay, as a function of whether there's one mainline ad or three mainline ads. This is a super straightforward question, right? Because what I'm going to do, a user's going to show up in search, I'm going to flip a coin, either show them one mainline ad or show them three mainline ads. Right? Um, they're going to see the layout and respond in some way. Okay? That way it could be either clicking or not clicking. Um, and we'll do this for many, many users, and we'll get a bunch of data. And the data will say, okay, when you showed them one mainline ad, this is the probability click on the, on the first slot, and we showed them three, so we'll probably click on the third slot. So that's, that's, that works really well. Let's um, change the question a little bit. Let's suppose I cared about Google's revenue, which is actually, I think, what Google might care about. Um, suppose I care about Google's revenue. So Google's revenue is 
based both on the clicks of the users, but also on what the advertisers bid to be shown in that slot. Okay, so probably most of you know this, but those ads that you see on Google are actually run in real-time auctions, where uh, every time there's a search, we figure out which advertisers might be interested in that search from the bids they put in previously. Right? If they are matched, then we run an auction in real time with all those bids and basically decide which slots people get based on that real-time auction. Okay, so here's what happens. The advertisers bid, you know, maybe uh, at the beginning, okay? And then we get a bunch of traffic, and we're gonna, um, the users show up and we randomize search to A or B, right? Um, and then, after seeing a whole bunch of those searches, we see what the outcome the advertiser got, like how many clicks they got that pay period, right? Or, uh, and how many impressions they got that pay period. Okay, and the thing I want to point out to you is that the situation is really different because between these two scenarios, right? Because here, a thing that we care about a lot is what the advertisers are bidding, right? If they bid more, we get more revenue. Right? That's happening before we randomize. And we're showing the randomization to the users, not the advertisers. Okay? So, um, What's, what's interesting about this is the auction we actually ran um, is not either A or B. It's actually this strange auction which sometimes is A and sometimes is B. Right, because you're an advertiser, you're spinning in one bid, and that's getting used in both auction types. So that bid is an, a bid in, in some mixture of the two auctions, some randomization of the two auctions. Okay, so it's a 50-50 mix of A or B. So I have a, a little picture of this. Okay, so um, the model I have in mind is this position auction, well, uh, as it's called in the literature, which is um, I have a bunch of bidders, I have a bunch of positions. Think of these as the slots on the side of the search page. Okay, um, and bidders are assigned to positions in order of their bids, and if you uh, are clicked on, then you pay your bid. So imagine that's the model that Google uses to run these auctions. It's not quite the model, but it's close enough. Okay, but you imagine if I have three mainline ads, those are really prominent, so probably the click probability is a lot higher for the mainline ads than the side bar ads, right? So if I have three mainline ads, the profile of click probability probably looks something like this. Okay? And if I have one mainline ad, it might look something like this. So there's only one ad in the mainline, so it gets all of that extra attention, right? And then the side bar ads get all the a little bit of attention. Okay? And so if I flip a coin to do A or B, then the advertisers actually feel just a mixture of these two. Okay, they're going to feel something that looks kind of like that, where I just average the two <coughs> auctions. Okay? And so here's the thing. If you were bidding just in A, that's the blue. If you were bidding just in B, that's the red. But if you're bidding in a 50-50 mix of A or B, that's the gray dash line. Okay? And the point is, is as we talked about on the first slide, if I change the rules, you probably change how you bid. So what the, what's going on here is I now have bids for this gray auction, which is neither of the auctions I cared about. Okay, so the question is, is how do we then do what I want to do, which I want to tell you which has more revenue, blue or red. But I have bids for gray. Okay, so that was a little bit, this, this is kind of complicated. Let's make a much simpler example. Okay, so toy example, auction A is to sell one unit among three bidders. So if you're the highest bidder, you get the thing with probability one. If you're the lowest bidders, two bidders, you get the thing with probability zero. Right? Uh, auction two is two units. If you're the highest two bidders, you get the good with probability one. If you're the lowest bidder, you get the good with probability zero. Okay, and then I can flip a coin. And so the highest bidder gets it with probability one. The second highest bidder, so half the time we're in the one bidder auction and we don't get it. Half the time we're in the two bidder auction and we do get it. So we get with probably 0.5 in the mix of the two auctions. Okay, and the, the last bidder never gets it. Okay, so here's, here's the sort of basic question that we're asking. If the auction we run is the gray auction, how can I compare the revenues of the red auction and the blue auction? Okay, and again, you're going to bid differently in all three of these auctions. Okay, so um, 
I simulated some data just to give you a flavor for what's going to happen here. Okay? So um, there are some standard models of auction theory to understand how people bid in auctions. And so I picked one of the standard models of auction theory and I simulated some data in these auctions. And so I just said, you know, what if we did this A-B test that you might do in the industry um, to try to figure this out? So um, I ran, uh, I basically, I ran 200 auctions. I flipped the coin to run A or B. I showed you auction one was A, auction two was A, auction three was B. Um, I showed you what my three bids were from the model bidding in the 50-50 mix over A and B, so bidding in auction C. Okay, and I showed you what my revenue is. Okay, and this is obvious, right? Because um, in uh, auction one was A, so it sells one item to the top bidder. So its revenue should be the highest of those three bids, which is 74 cents, so it's 74 cents. Okay, whereas auction three is B, and so it's the highest sum of the two bids, so it's 69 cents plus 83 cents, which is 153. Okay, we just get the total revenue. So I just wrote down what we would get in the auction. Okay, and so here's, um, and so uh, as was said, I used to get Microsoft Research, and uh, Microsoft runs one auction like this, and so I used to talk to the team that was building the auctions, and I asked them how they measure their revenue. And the story I get, I mean, who you knows exactly what they're doing, but this is the impression I got, something kind of like this. So we look at the times we ran the auction A, we sum up those revenues, and that gives us an estimate for the revenue we get from auction A. We look at the times we ran auction B, we sum up those revenues, that's the estimate for the revenue we get from auction B. Okay, and so this says, look, auction B is better. It gets uh, about uh, $1.20 per auction. Whereas uh, option A is getting about 75 cents uh, per option. But if you think about this, something's going really wrong, right? Because the bidders are bidding before they know what auction we're running. Okay? And auction A is just always selling one item, which means it's just summing the highest bid. Auction B is always just summing the highest two bids. And so I say, which is better? If I'm going to fix the bids in advance, which is better? Taking the highest bid or taking the highest two bids? Always taking the highest two bids is better. Right? No one's bidding negative numbers, so it's always better to take the highest two bids. Okay? So you're always going to see this number bigger than this number, no matter what. Okay? But if you know the, you know, uh, uh, I mean, in, in economics, it's sort of straightforward that um, if I have more competition, meaning only one item I'm selling, people should bid higher to compete for that one item. If I have less competition, I'm selling two items, people are probably going to bid less because there are fewer items. And so in this calculation, there's a missing effect, which is people should be bidding more in auction one versus auction two, which I don't have because they're only bidding in auction C, which is the mix of the two auctions. Okay, so um, what I call an improper A-B test is just this back of the envelope calculation which always says auction B is better than auction A. Okay, um, and that's got a missing effect. Um, yeah, this, this uh, it doesn't fit on my, my screen, that's fun. Um, if you were to, again, so I had this data from a model, right, from the economic model, and so I could generate from the same economic model what the bids would be if I just ran A, if I just ran B. And it turns out I chose the model such that actually they're all the same. Like uh, the, the revenue you get from C is basically one, the revenue you get from A is basically one, the revenue you get from B is basically one, they're all the same. Okay, now I could have chosen a different model, I could have chosen a model where A is better, I could have chosen a model where B is better, and C would be a dead in the middle. Okay, because it's a mix of the two. Um, but what the, the take home is is that this, is, this test is always going to show B is better. Um, and it's missing the effect that more competition should lead to higher bids. Okay, so the, um, the point of the, the work I want to talk about today is how to actually <coughs> take this into account properly and how to properly estimate the revenue of A and B from bids in auction C. Okay, and um, uh, I hear there's uh, a great interest in data science and, and information here in the business school, and I, I think that um, one of the most important things when I hear people talking about data science that they miss is understanding how to make the processes that generate the data 
generate better data for you. And that's sort of a fundamental thing that we're looking at in this, in this talk, in, this, in this, the work that we do. Cool. So um, what I'm going to do for the rest of the talk, I'm going to give you a, first a brief overview of the results that we were able to, we, we spent uh, actually a number of years studying this problem, trying to figure out like, what the best uh, uh, approach to take was to understand it. Um, so I'm going to give you an overview of the results we were able to obtain. I'm then going to um, talk sort of briefly about two sort of vignettes uh, of uh, how to understand um, economic inference, which is a key part. And if, if I want to know um, what's going to happen if I run a different auction, I need to do some inference to know why people were bidding what they're bidding, so that I can take them out of the context they were in and say, how would they bid in some new context? Okay, so if I want to do counterfactual revenue estimates, estimate the revenue of an auction I did not run from bids in an auction I did run, I have to know why those bids are those bids, so I have to do inference. And then I have to say, okay, given that inference, what do I predict the revenue would be in my new scenario? So these, these are my two steps. The first step is inference, the second step is predicting revenue to get the inference out. Okay? And the last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to show you that um, these standard sort of approaches in economics, you can combine and get a really nice revenue estimator that actually makes this whole calculation quite straightforward. Cool. Okay, so just um, a little bit of notation so you can understand uh, what we're doing with this. Again, if you, t if you do a data study, you, you tend to wonder, you know, how good are my estimates of things as a function of how much data I have? And so this is what I'm talking about here. Okay, so if I have capital N samples of bids in my auction, um, and my auctions were these position auctions I was talking about on the first couple of slides, and if they're uh, little n positions, that's how many agents show up to each auction. Uh, capital N might be um, little n times the number of auctions I ran. Okay, so if I had three auctions and I ran 200, three bidders and I ran 200 auctions like I did in the first set of data, then I have um, 600, a uh, couple of them is 600, so I did get 600 data points for my data distribution. Okay, and I'm imagining we're going to do an A-B test. We're going to send some of the, we're going to um, run some auctions B and some auctions A, and I'll imagine we're going to run auction B with some probability epsilon, okay, which might not be 50-50. Okay, maybe we'll run auction B with 0.1 chance, right, and auction A with 0.9 chance. And I'm curious as to how good my revenue estimate of auction B is as a function of the probability I run auction B. Okay, and obviously, the less I run auction B, the worse my data is for auction B. Right? The less dependent the data is on auction B. Okay? Um, great. So here are the results I want to talk about. So one, I'm going to give you an estimator for estimating the revenue of auctions uh, A and B directly from the bids in auction C. So I ran auction C. I want to know the revenue of auction A or auction uh, B. I'll give you an estimator for that. That estimator is just a weighted order statistic. Okay, that is a very simple object. What does that mean? That means if I have capital N bids, I'm going to sort them in decreasing order. Okay? Then my estimator will tell me what weights to use. I'm going to take these bids and multiply them in a sorted order and just add them up. Okay, so it's a weighted order statistic. Okay, uh, we're going to analyze the error of our uh, estimator for the estimating the revenue of B, and the dependence is going to have the usual error that you get from almost any statistics you'd ever do, which is 1 over square root the number of samples. Okay, and the thing I want to draw your attention to is the dependence on the probability that I run auction B is, well, as you'd expect, the smaller chance I run auction B, that should make my error fail. Right? So as epsilon gets small, 1 over epsilon gets big. Right? 1 over epsilon gets big, and so log 1 over epsilon gets bigger. Right? So my error gets bigger as epsilon gets smaller, the less chance I run B. Um, but what I want to draw your attention to is there's a log on it, and log is a very slow growing function. Okay? Um, so uh, for example, log of 3 trillion is like 42. So very big numbers get very small when you uh, take the logarithm. 
Um, back in, the, in 2008, when they had the big stimulus, it was something like $3 trillion, and they asked some mathematicians uh, you know, to help us visualize that. So $3 trillion is dollar bills stacked up to the moon, okay, and log of that is 42. <laughs> okay, so that's a really small number. Okay? Um, and I want to compare the estimator we get to what I call the ideal A-B test. Okay, so what's an ideal A-B test for this auction environment? Well, if I were to tell the bidders I'm running auction A, or I'm running auction B, and they bid for A or they bid for B, okay, that would be an ideal A-B test. So I, I, every time I run an auction, I tell the bidders, hey, we're doing a one-item auction. Okay, and then they bid for the one-item auction. Or in a shop, I'm like, hey, I put the coin, we're doing a two-item auction. And they bid for a two-item auction. Okay, and then if I'm going to run um, some large number of auctions and some fraction epsilon of those are auctions B. And I just say, okay, well, how, do I, how good is my estimate for auction B? Well, how many samples do I have from auction B? Well, if I run auction B in epsilon fraction of the time, then I have epsilon N samples from B. Okay, and the usual statistics say my error is related to 1 over square, uh, square root the number of samples. And in this case, that's 1 over square root N times epsilon. Okay, so I get a square root epsilon, one over square root epsilon in the, uh, here. Okay, and again, as epsilon gets small, this gets big, right? But square root epsilon, is, square root is a way bigger function, faster growing function than log. Okay, so this error bound is way worse than the error bound that, that we are going to get. Okay, and this is, um, you know, I think kind of puzzling, right? Like, somehow, Doing some magic with econometrics, which is what, to, which is what I'm going to do, is going to give us better error bounds than having done an ideal A-B test if we actually were able to set up our experiment correctly. Okay, and so why is that possible? And here's the thing, and this comes back to the, um, the, 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 you know, the auction you choose to run impacts how good your data is. Okay, and here's the point. If uh, if we do the, the, the non-ideal A-B test, we just actually mix and people bid, and they bid one bid for both, uh, both auctions, like the mixture of the auctions, okay? The point is, is that every bid takes into account that there's a little bit of B in that auction. So every bid is giving me some information, okay? Whereas if I did the ideal A-B test, only an epsilon fraction of the bids have anything to do with B. Okay? So actually, from a statistical point of view, it can be better to do the non-ideal thing and get the bids that have a mixture. And because, and, um, and because this auction has a little bit of B in it, it means the thing I want to estimate is a little bit there in the data, which means I'll actually be able to get good error balance and estimate. Okay? Um, I'm going to skip the, the last two points. Cool. Uh, so uh, this, this is the theoretical bound. So we did a bunch of statistics uh, and mathematical analysis, and we, and we proved the theorem about what our error bounds are. Um, I want to show you some data, uh, some simulation results from data, because this estimator works really well. Um, so here, uh, here I've got some data where we um, took the capital M number of samples going this way. We took little n, the number of bidders that show up in each auction, going this way. Um, and then I normalized by the usual error rate in statistics, which is root n. Okay, because I wanted to, if, otherwise you just see these numbers getting really small as they got, they got big samples. Okay, so I divide by the error that you usually get in statistics so that these are sort of normalized by what you'd expect from the variance of the, uh, uh, of the sampling process. Okay, and so given my bound, you would expect that if I divide by 1 over n, it would just be a constant, right? So if you look on across, it's basically a constant. Okay, so good. So the data behaves like our analysis said it should. Okay, um, one thing that uh, you can point out that you, we obviously in our theory analysis didn't do right, and this maybe is an opportunity to do a better analysis, is that we said that the error should get bigger as the, we have more agents showing up in the auction. And so as you go down, you don't really see that. Or you go down, the error is the same. 
right? So maybe it's not going to improve our theoretical analysis. And oftentimes, it, you know, this is what we're able to prove with math. And you actually try it in reasonable scenarios, and hey, it works a lot better than we, than we thought it was going to from the theory. Um, one thing I'll say is that um, over here, we're talking about, I have 10 samples from the distribution, 10, 10 bits. I'm able to estimate the revenue uh, in a reasonable, you know, uh, this is probably 5% uh, accuracy. Okay, because I got uh, the square root factor canceling. Um, and this is actually interesting because I have 10 samples for my bit distribution, and I'm going to get an error of like 5%. Which, if you were going to try to do the usual econometric approach, of inverting values from bids and then solving for the revenue, which I'm going to talk about in a second. If you do that approach, you couldn't do anything with 10 samples. You would need uh, tens of thousands of samples before you could do anything with the standard approaches and econometrics uh, for working on this. And I can already get 5% accuracy with 10 samples from my bid distribution, which um, is impressive. Okay. Um, cool, so my, uh, my goal is to now tell you a little bit about some of the key ideas that go into this. Um, given the time, I probably will not do very much of my revenue analysis, but I'll, I'll try to go into detail into the econometric stuff, because I think that if we're, if, uh, you know, given the um, importance of data science these days, uh, and I think that, you know, one thing that's sort of funny is that I often don't see econometricians included in the data science discussions that we're having, at least at Northwestern. And I think that's a big mistake because econometrics is actually doing really important stuff um, that we really need to get uh, into the standard data science uh, uh, um, toolkit. So I'm going to spend most of my time on that. Um, and then maybe I'll skip to, to show you uh, how we do this sort of magical thing that gives us an uh, estimator that works with 10 samples. Cool, so here's the assumption that we make at the beginning of doing uh, an analysis, an economic analysis of, uh, of an auction. Okay, we have to assume that the bidders have somehow optimized and they're doing a good job. They're happy with how they're doing things. Okay, if we don't assume that bidders are happy with how they're doing things, we, have no, we don't have the data to, to do anything. Okay, so we assume the bidders are happy with their bids, um, and the, uh, so we, uh, this should be at equilibrium, meaning uh, given what everyone else is doing as a bidder, I'm happy to do what I did. Uh, and so what that means is that the bidder's bids must be in best response to the competing distribution of bids from other bidders. Right? So what a bidder is doing is a good thing given the distribution of bids that we're getting. And here's the amazing thing. We actually have the distribution of bids in the data. Okay, so we know exactly what the bidders have optimized against. They've optimized against the distribution of bids, and we see that. Okay, so now it's just a question of, oh, you're optimizing against the distribution of bids. Okay, what must you have been thinking for the bid that you made to bid any good at all? Okay, what, in other words, if you think back to my very first example of the auction, Right, those bidders that have a value, like uh, the bidder who won had a value of 12 and they bid 6. Right? So I want to know the 12. Okay? And so I'm thinking if you bid 6, given this bid distribution, what value must you have had to make that a good bid? Okay? And I see the competing bid distribution. Okay? So we, I, I, I took the data that I had from my first couple of slots and I said, okay, bidder 1. What is bidder 1 thinking? And I said, okay, well, let's plot the bids, the distribution of bids I get from bidders two and three, because they're competing against bidders two and three. Okay? And so I plotted these where I plot the bids versus quantiles. So what do I mean by that? I just took all the bids, I had 200, I sorted them, okay, and I just plot them on a zero one axis where the highest bidder is here at one, the lowest bidder is here at zero, and I just plotted these increasing this basically the big function in quantile space. Okay, and so what happens in the auction? Every time uh, bidder one shows up, they're going to get a random one of these guys, a bidder one, twos, and random bidder three, and they're bidding against those cards. Okay, and so bidder one can think, oh, from any bid I put in, what's my chance of winning? 
okay, we can plot that function too. So this is bidder one's chance of winning as a function of any bid they would put in, okay, given that those are the competing bid distributions, okay? So if we draw a random bidder two and a random bidder three from this distribution, right, and we say, what's the probability that bidder one wins? It's this function. This is just empirical from my data. Cool. So given the bid distribution which I observe, I want to solve for the bid strategy, and then I want to invert the bid strategy to see what value a bidder must have had for any bid they put. That's the, that's the basic uh, idea here. Okay, so let's walk through how that's going to happen. So let's think about how bidder one should bid an auction C. Okay, and so think about what bidder one should bid an auction C. I'm thinking, okay, suppose I'm bidder one and my value is B, and I'm thinking, oh, I could bid B. Should I? So let's evaluate my utility as a bidder if my value is B and I bid B. So that's actually pretty easy to do. So again, here was my curve before, and I just, you know, it was kind of a bumpy line, but it's basically a straight line, a slope one. So let's just approximate it that way in our head so we can do calculus. Um, so we have a, the probability of winning is um, at a bid B, is just B, up until you bid over one, the probability of winning is one. And you can't win with high probability of one, right? Winning with probability of one is winning all the time. Okay, and so this is bidding higher than every other bidder. Right, so obviously you're never gonna bid two, right? Because all you needed to win with certainty was one. And so if you're gonna pay your bid when you win, you should never bid two. Right, cool. So um, what's your utility as a bidder if your value is B and you bid B? Well, if you win, you're gonna get V, but you're gonna pay B. Okay, so your utility is V minus B times probability you're winning which actually you can draw on here. If you put V on the horizontal axis and V on the horizontal axis, you should obviously bid less than your value, right? Then V minus B is this blank, right? And the probability you win with bid B is the height of the curve at B, right? So this amount is just the area of the, the rectangle line. If it was like a square here, but it's, it's really a rectangle. Cool, and um, we just said this function is basically you win with probability B if your bid is B, right? For this particular example. So I can just fill in that function. So if you're basically your utility is B minus B times B if your value is B and you bid B. Cool, so um, I guess like calculus 101, right? Uh, if we want to optimize this function as a bidder, our value is B, what's our best bid to put in? Right? We differentiate it and set it equal to zero, and we solve for what bid we should put in, right? Cool, so that's actually pretty easy to do. Um, so take the derivative of set it equal to zero and solve, and you're gonna see, aha, uh -huh, it's optimal. I'm gonna stand away from that. <laughs> it's optimal to bid half your value. Okay, and if you remember the very first slide, Mr. 12 bid six, that was half its value. I was exactly showing you the equilibrium that you get here in this in this uh, scenario. Okay? But cool. This is a very specific suggestion. If your value is V, you're going to bid V over 2. Very specific. And here's the point. I've observed all the bids of everybody. Okay? So if I observe your bid as B, I can infer that your value must have been 2B. And so now I know what you were thinking when you placed that bid B, which is really good, because I'm going to change the auction up on you and run a different auction. I want to figure out how you would bid in that auction, which would not be the same as your bid in the past auction. Right? You're going to bid some new amount. Right? And so since I know what your value is and what you were thinking, now I can solve for what would be the equilibrium in the new auction to figure out what you should bid there. And now I can do a revenue comparison to say, what's the revenue in that auction? So um, we saw that bids were uniform 0, 1 in our example, right? There's just this line increasing, which is basically the uniform distribution on 0, 1 for the bids. And so if bids are uniform 0, 1 and values are twice bids, well, then values are uniform 0, 2. Okay, so now I know the distribution of values to generate the data that I saw. And now I can solve for the revenue in any auction I want. 
Okay, and the classic auction theory will tell you how to do that. Okay, um, now is the point in the talk when I usually would tell you how to do that classic auction theory, but in the interest of time, I think I'm gonna uh, skip that and jump to um, the how to get the revenue estimators that we're talking about to actually do this estimation. Which is gonna need this, but I'll just assume it as a fact, I won't tell you where it comes from. Okay, um, the one sad thing about skipping it is, um, is Roger Meyerson uh, that uh, got the Nobel Prize for this work uh, in 2007. Really amazing stuff, amazing theory. But you guys can read about it. I have some pictures because they're nice pictures to go with it. Cool. Let's talk about uh, this estimation problem. Okay, so. Um, we walk through a specific example of how to infer values from bids in given a specific distribution of the bids, right? You could, of course, do that in general for like a functional, like if you have a functional form for your bid distribution. And so I just wrote down here what the equations you would have gotten if you, did the, if you worked out that math, to, you know, took the derivative, set equal to zero in general. You get this formula. And what is this formula? It's saying your value is a function of your quantile. Again, I'm sorting bidders by quantile. Right? So the highest bidders have the highest quantile one, lowest bidder quantile zero. So your value is a function of your quantile, and the bid distribution is equal to your bid, according to the distribution, plus the amount you shade your bid, which is related to the allocation rule of the auction, which is something I sort of skipped over, and the derivative of the bid distribution. Okay, and why does the derivative of the bid distribution come up here? Well, look. You wrote down utility and you took derivatives and said equal to zero. So their derivatives are coming up because you took the derivative and you said equal to zero. Right? Um, cool. Uh, the point is, is that if I know what auction I ran, I know what the, the allocation rules of those auctions are, so I know the S's. Um, the blue are always what I infer from my data. Okay, the bid distribution, the derivative distribution, those are in my data. Um, cool. Uh, the auction theory I skipped tells you how to calculate revenue from values. And so there's a formula for calculating revenue from values, which is this formula, which let's skip. And I could plug in my value formula that I got from the inference into my revenue formula and just estimate the revenue. Okay? And if you do this with your samples, well, you can estimate the bid distribution with the usual statistical error of square root n. Uh, you also have to estimate the derivative bid distribution, though. And for anyone who's done statistics of functions knows that estimating the derivative of a function is kind of annoying because noise blows up in it. You have to do some kind of smoothing to make it work. And so typically, you're going to get a worse rate than the root n rate because of the derivative. Okay? So take home message. If you have just a bid function, you're really happy, but the derivative bids sort of makes you sad because it makes your error a lot bigger. Okay? Um, cool. So uh, now I want to tell you uh, one of the main contributions of our paper here, which is um, basically just combining these theorems and getting rid of that derivative bit so everything works out nicely. And so here's the idea, and it's sort of obvious in hindsight. I think a lot of good science is obvious in hindsight. Um, once, you, once you see it, you can't unsee it. Uh, but before you see it, you're like, how do you do that? Um, so just take this inference function and just plug it into the revenue function. Okay? And if I do that, I'm going to get some equation like this, which looks like a mess, right? What I want to point out is it's got this function, which is the derivative of the bids, uh, the, the bid distribution. And it's got some stuff I know times this derivative of the bid distribution. Okay? And this is annoying. They have to act as the derivative of the distribution. But if you learn one thing from Calc 101, right? You learn integration by parts. What does that do? It swaps where the derivative is. Right? And so if I'm integrating this thing, I could do integration by parts on this last term to swap where the derivative is. In other words, to take the derivative off the bids where I don't like it and put it on these things that I know everything about. Okay, there's no problem with derivatives on things I know everything about. I just calculate the derivative. Right? It's a problem where it's on a statistical quantity that's, that's annoying. Okay, so if you do that, you can basically then refactor the whole thing into some coefficients times 
the actual bits, not the derivative bits anymore. Okay, and this is why I said um, that the estimator, which I'm sorry you can't see, is just a weighted order statistic. I basically, these coefficients tell me how to weight the order statistics, and then when I take my bid distribution, this is just sorting the bids in order. Okay, so integrating some coefficients times the bid sorted in order is just a weighted order statistic. Okay? So that's sort of our uh, direct approach to input. So from the bids in option C, I can directly give you the revenue of the bids in option, uh, the revenue of option A and option B, just using this formula. Cool. So this um, summarizes again uh, the results that we had. Um, and uh, I want to conclude by saying, you know, from a computer science point of view, why did I uh, think this study was interesting in the first place? Um, I think that we're trying to understand how to get computation to work in the wild. In the wild, I've got local authorization of individuals, um, which I can maybe observe and understand sort of what's driving that and figure out how I can make interventions to change the computations happening to get better outcomes uh, in, in these systems. All right, thank you for your attention.